Cougs house. The Houston Cougars start summer workouts in less than a month, but the Cougs got a brand new date to circle on the calendar this summer. You are Locked On Cougs, your daily podcast on the Houston Cougars, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to Locked On Cougs, the daily podcast about your Houston Cougars. I'm your host, Houston-born teacher and coach Parker Antrith, here to break down all things Cougs. And if you're a Houston fan or just a hater came to by, thank you for making Locked On Cougs your first listen of the the day. If you want to join the conversation but don't know what to say, tell us in the comment section down below, wherever you found this podcast, whatever letter you think is silent in the word scent, like how something smells. Today's show is brought to you by FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Fun stuff to talk about with them later. we got a bunch of fun stuff on the show today, including a segment on basketball and some stuff changing with the schedule over on the basketball side of things in a good way, I think. More on that later. I want to talk about future quarterback play for Houston. A lot, lot to talk about and breaking down what that could look like. But some more clarity on the Houston Cougars starting quarterback up in the near future this fall as of when, Monday afternoon, Wednesday. As of Monday afternoon, Just Duarte tweeted an article, and in that article he talked to Willie Fritz, head coach of the football program, and Donovan Smith is coming back this Summer. He'll be back on July 1st. He's going to be cleared for activities. If all things are going according to play. Now, Donovan Smith's first year in Houston, I feel like drew some unfair criticism as a whole. He did uh, complete just over 64% of his balls, trying to get the number right exactly, 64.5% of the balls he threw for 2,800 yards, uh, had 22 passing touchdowns and 13 interceptions. I feel like that's closer to the mean of college football than people gave him credit for. Frankly, I think it's a little bit above that, actually, in most statistical categories. But folks wanted more. I think, honestly, they felt like they wanted to see the running quarterback that Houston saw from Texas Tech last year for some more of a dual threat kind of guy. Diamond shows up for his second year at Houston, first year in a system under Kevin Barbe, though. And so we'll see kind of what that goes. I do feel confident saying they're going to throw the ball less next season than they did last season. And I actually think that plays into what Diamond does very well pretty well and it's going to use his legs in the run game a little bit more it's more rpo option kind of stuff gets him on the perimeter and has with his leg like running threat his legs offer kind of a third threat the running back on a read option the spitting the ball out to a quick slant or a stick route or a quick fade or whatever on the same option and also him as a dynamic playmaker himself with the ball in his hands running around is Always a good tertiary option. I think it's a good setup and fit, and I'm glad to hear he'll be back on July 1st. It's really, really important for Houston. A bunch of new transfers coming into the program, obviously. We outlined a number of them that just committed over the weekend uh, on Monday's episode, but a couple key names there are some wide receivers uh, like Shoulder coming in from Tulsa. Uh, you got to make sure you also pay t- to his former teammate. <clears throat> sorry, for his former teammate, Devin Williams. That's Marquis Shoulders and Devin Williams, both coming in from Tulsa. A couple of dynamic playmakers in their own right. Your return, Joseph Manjack. Your return, Boogie Johnson. A lot of plays to be made on the outside, getting the timing down with all those guys. You're only returning. Man Jack from your starting kind of big core three. Obviously, Boogie played some last year, but you're hoping to kind of build on that, uh, you know, timing and consistency as early as possible in the new offense. What the new reads will be, make sure we're reading the defense together the same way, right? You want your quarterback and the receiver reading the if this, then that kind of stuff at the same level and at the same rate. 
getting them on the same page as early as July 1st can be really important with practices starting uh, about four weeks out from that first game, right? And so you got about a month of individual work before getting to team practices, and it's every single minute of that's going to be important for them as they get together. Now, do I think that's enough time to gel with the new wideouts? I do. I feel like, uh, frankly, you've got the wideouts working together in conjunction with a lot of things. Uh, Zeon Chris out there working with them as well, amongst a couple other uh, guys further down the depth charts. Um, but I think Donovan has time to work with them in July and then obviously in practices with the first team reps in August that it should still be his job to lose. We we talked about as we led up to the spring game that Donovan Smith had that shoulder labrum surgery uh, back at the start of the offseason and missed all the throwing from spring practice. But he was super, super involved. I mean, you can, there are videos of him playing dummy pass rush. He's doing footwork drills. He's extremely involved in the uh, spring practices. And I think that all helps him. He should have like the IQ part of it up to snuff. He just has to go out and do the execution part of it this fall. And I, I don't know. I'm expecting a, a big fall out of him. I think that limiting the passing game and using the running game to kind of adjust how the coverage looks is actually going to help him a lot. Um, it's going to make, frankly, other teams have to respect the run, and in doing so, that pulls guys out of coverage. Houston has wildly talented receivers. I know that you feel like they lost them because they did, right? Sam Brown was a loss. Matt Golden was a loss. I'm not, frankly, even Dalton Garns was a loss, right? I'm not trying to say they weren't, but I am trying to say that the room is that talented. And uh, even if you lose a, a top end prospect like Mikhail Harrison Pilot, you got guys that have done it before in the room right now. I'm excited about where that goes. I'm excited where the passing game goes. Um, obviously, the way this could work poorly is if we hear, like, in late June leading up to July 1st, like, oh, wait a second. Actually, uh, it's looking more like July 8th. Actually, it's looking more like July 15th. Okay, actually, we're keeping it short and not throwing full speed until, like, if things were to slow down, right? If you were to get those hiccups, now that we have a date on it, a date that he should be back by, we're theoretically under the you know guise of like if it's any later than July first, something's wrong. Well, truthfully, it might just be going slower. That means something's wrong, right? And it's gonna be hard to shake that feeling though when we get there. To watch the reports after talking to Fritz that uh, Coach Willie Fritz feels like they're being smart with the way they're approaching the shoulder surgery and recovery time. July 1st would be about six months, uh, give or take a couple weeks. And I think that's fair. Um, frankly, he won't get hit probably until the first game. You might do something in a late practice, but you want to preserve all those hits he's going to take and the beating he's going to take for the season the best you can. Uh, obviously, quarterbacks wear different color jerseys to practice for a reason, but I mean even in uh, the live drills, you kind of want to get a little bit of stuff uh, during the practice in like a very controlled circumstances. I bet Donovan gets even less – of that than normal. Um, and I think that you're building up to a season that people have a lot of excitement about because of the staff. And honestly, Donovan's going to be kind of in charge of shepherding in a new era of Houston Cougar football. And he's a starting quarterback, starting quarterbacks, the face of the program, in a lot of ways, um, great leader, great character guy. And I think a developing quarterback that continues to find ways to improve. And I know people were, wanted more last year, but I really think that we're set up to have a pretty strong fall this year. Now, I think the bigger question is what happens in this program in the Willie Fritz era after Donovan? Who comes next? What can Houston Cooker fans expect from that ever so important quarterback position? And I do want to talk about that for a second, but first I got the NBA playoffs on right next to me. I know you probably got them on somewhere. You might have the hockey playoffs on. Whatever playoffs you got on, it is winner-take-all time in both the NBA and the NHL. And FanDuel is giving you a shot to bring home a big win of your own. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. But $150, get $150 bucks on, to bet on point spreads, money lines, player props, and more. All that fight of bet has to do is hit and it works. It's fanduel.com slash locked on. Make every playoff shot count FanDuel, America's number one sports book. 
All right. I said the question for this program may very well be what comes after Donovan Smith. Not because I think we should look past how much fun this fall could be with Donovan, but because ultimately, uh, you know, his last year in the program is overlapping with Fritz's first year in the program. And the decision they make with what comes next could be really important. Now, the natural next guy is Deion Chris, dual threat quarterback. He'll have had a year in the offense and a run heavy offense. He's an elusive runner himself. I imagine, like I've said before, that there's even times you're going to use him in packages on the field this fall. I think he is a natural guy of two years of eligibility after this season, a natural guy to hand the reins to for sure. Obviously. And frankly, if you can't tell by my uh, excitement and my voice, I, I am excited to have that kind of guy on the field. People talk to me about your favorite Houston Cougars come through. I love Greg Ward's the world, right? I love, love, love an electric running quarterback. I even, I mean, Greg could throw the ball. I think Zion is going to be able to throw the ball. I'd even take guys that can't throw it as well if they can run. I love a good running quarterback for whatever, just the schematics, the fun you can have with the offense and all that. I think Zan's going to be able to throw. It's a true dual threat guy. But if you're asking for why I'm excited about that, I, I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, which also brings me to who may be next next. Now, Keyshawn Henderson is an interesting pickup for Houston if he were to come. Keyshawn Henderson is a 2026 high school recruit, so he would not be on campus for a solid, oh, what is it, two years at this point, right? So you'd get Donovan, then you get Zion, and then coming after Zion with either a red shirt or competing for the job, whatever, would be Keyshawn Henderson. Um, Keyshawn is listed at six three and a half, uh, about one hundred seventy five pounds, and an athlete positionally in recruit rankings. He listed at the top athlete by position in twenty twenty six. He's got. Some big time, I mean, blue blood of the blue blood, power five offers as a receiver. He also plays on the defensive side of the ball, some safety and corner. Um, but Houston's made it as one of the schools that people are considering him high on in recruit rankings and evaluations because Houston has offered him as a quarterback. He's been a high school quarterback. That's what he thinks he is good at. Uh, and frankly, being the school that offers him as a quarterback – may ultimately land the kid in Houston if he were to come. Now, he's also high on Baylor and Oklahoma. My arguments for those two would be that with Baylor, you honestly you don't know what coach you're going to have by 2026. Uh, Aranda's kind of on the hot seat. People are surprised he's still there. Oklahoma, while you've seen people have success there at quarterback, like the Baker Mayfields and the Kyler Murrays and so on, that was a whole different coaching system. We're still trying to figure out what the Oklahoma team looks like, um, frankly. And I'm not just saying this because Houston's playing them a couple times in the next five years. Um, I don't think they're as good under this administration as they were under Riley. And I think that it's worth paying attention to like where that program is heading directionally um, between now. Now they have the resources and, and all that. They're going kind to of get more resources to the SEC, but... I say that to say that of the schools that people are high on connecting Keyshawn Henderson with, I think Houston's got a real shot here. And he would be a transformative type of athlete to come through Houston. I mean, it would be a generate the kind of guy that oh, I remember watching him play as a so and I mean, you're talking about a long time from now, right? He's that kind of talented athlete. But Houston offering him a quarterback spot when he can play quarterback, this is not just like out of the blue. Um, is interesting. It ultimately seems like it's going to come down to does Keyshawn Henderson want to play quarterback and build at a program like Houston or go to a program that's established and built already and be a receiver, right? And I know what I would pick. Uh, you only get to live the dream out once. Uh, you can always switch positions in the pros. Like Again, I mentioned Greg Ward earlier like he did. If that's what they decide your pro position is, or you can come show you can play it and get to go play it at the pro level. Right, like I think that's a win-win, um, but I, I digress. Another guy to keep an eye on as far as future Houston Cougar quarterbacks go is Adam Scoble. Adam is class of 2025, six four and a half, a much more traditional passing quarterback, uh, six four and a half, 200 pounds from Columbus, Texas. Originally committed to Baylor, that's important. In a second, but has decommitted to recommit to Oklahoma State. Now, when he was at committed to Baylor. 
Sean Bell was crucial in the recruitment, knew the dad well. Uh, they went way back. Uh, the connection between Bell and Scoble and the kid himself, Adam, was really, really close. Um, and then when that stat, when Sean Bell came to Houston from Baylor, kind of hush hush opened the recruitment. He chose Oklahoma State. Those ties are still there. Uh, Scoble is a one of the top quarterbacks in the 2025 class nationally. Um, I think it's worth pointing out that like. That's that's not a for until he signs his paper and is on campus in Stillwater. I don't know that I'm going to believe that recruitment is over. And frankly, who's to say he's on the transfer pool a year later, right? I, I think that that's something that Houston's going to keep their eye on through the end of the process for sure. Bell and here are super close. You could see that being the guy that comes after Donovan Smith here in Houston. It's funny is as I mentioned the class of 2025. I. I think we all thought at one point when it looked like we were not making a coaching change um, that the next quarterback would be Jameson Kitna. Kitna's a three-star kid, uh, son of John Kitna, the NFL long-term NFL player. He's technically from Middleton, Ohio, um, but he did play some in Burleson, Texas as a freshman, sophomore. Um, 6'2", 215, fairly traditional quarterback. You know, he's got pro DNA very literally. Um, and, and frankly, I was excited about his arm strength and stuff like that as a young high school kid committed to Houston. He had committed under the Hulks and staff, withdrew his commitment. Houston remains in his top handful of schools, it looks like, so he's not writing them off. Um, so we'll see what Kitna looks like. I could also see him staying in the Midwest, closer where his family is now. Um, you know, we'll see. We'll see where that goes. Another one I mentioned, guys, that would be kind of up in the air, would they, wouldn't they come? Um, Keelan Russell has been committed to SMU for a while. He's from Duncanville, powerhouse program in the DFW Metroplex. 6'3", a buck 75, uh, a, a sprinter on the track team, seventh-ranked quarterback in the class 2025 nationally, high-end four-star, but... He made visits to Houston spring practices. He came to watch uh, multiple practices. He went out and worked out with some of the guys that were committed in the same class or in the 2024 class uh, afterwards. I mean, he he is known and welcome on campus and in the football offices and things like that. So while he has verbally committed to SMU, um, you know, it, it could come down to comparing. It's weird to think of them as the ACC still. It's weird, but comparing Big 12 and ACC football, right? It could be comparing what the travel looks like. Can your parents see you play? And I know that Duncanville and SMU are about 30 or 40 minutes apart as opposed to Houston and Duncanville. But where are the games being played, right? That could be a deciding factor. I think it's interesting that he came to spring practices. I think it's worth pointing out that these are high school kids and they aren't committed anywhere until they sign the dotted line. Even then, it's kind of a one semester commitment at this point, the way college football works. And so I think it's just something to keep an eye on. Um, again, you know me and I love running quarterbacks. Guy that runs the sprints, I mean, he's on the four by four team at Duncanville that I think they saw they went sub 40. Whew. Whew. That's fast. That's like really, really fast. I saw the thing the other day that there were four teams in Texas. Uh, four by one teams that want sub 40. I mean, you could be sub 40 and not place at the state meet. That's bonkers. Like that is elite international running bonkers. Um, a lot of digression there, but I think the quarterback position and the bar by offense and the Willie Fritz era is a fun, exciting place to look. It's great to hear good news out of Donovan Smith and his recovery and it's exciting to think about, okay, if Donovan's going to be healthy and good to go next fall, how does this thing keep building? Is he setting such a good foundation to build on? Uh, one program that's pretty well built is basketball, men's basketball specifically. And I want to talk some about something we heard on Monday that pertains to the men's basketball program kind of indirectly. But first, if you can't tell, I'm ready for the fall already. I want to go compete. I have a competitive side. And you've heard the show before. When I start talking about competing, I'm talking about Monopoly Go. You've probably gotten tired of me talking about Monopoly Go over and over again, but I play it over and over again, so that's the way that goes. Now, in Monopoly Go, you can team with your friends. It's not just about that competitive 
jerk that is Parker over here. Uh, you can also team up together like a team sport playing time tournaments where you work together to build up each other's boards. The more you win, the more awesome prize you unlock, like uh, unique stickers, cool playing pieces, fun emojis to talk trash with. Plus, Monopoly Go feels new and exciting every day with constantly changing tournaments and challenges a ton include their own unique mini games like digging for treasure or robot pachinko machine and there's always new timed events to help you win big like massive multipliers for everything you win or rent frenzies or anything there's always something fun to discover at monopoly go so get off the bench and go download it for free on google play or the app store game on All right, now, this bit of commentary on the men's basketball program is very much speculative at the schedule. We don't have a schedule yet. We don't know the matrix yet. We're still piecing together the non-conference. And we're being totally honest, but Bill Self, head coach at Kansas, told Kansas folks and reporters the Big 12 meetings, or after the Big 12 meetings, I should say, he mentioned that the Big 12 is going to a 20 conference game slate as opposed to the 18 conference game slate they had just last year. Now you're adding new teams. You're going to be up to 16 total teams. So makes some logical sense, right? Um, and I think it's safe to say that he reported this or he, he told this to reporters after the Big 12 meetings. And so it was probably something discussed at the Big 12 meetings, right? Like it was probably the kind of thing that people brought up with the bigger conference how things go there are multiple ways to do this because if you're one of 16 there are 15 other teams and now 20 basketball games to play uh, for example you could play 10 teams each once and the other five at a home and home right uh, you could have eight home uh, eight home and home games that get you up to 16 then have Four others, we have two home and two road. Those are kind of random and kind of over a handful of three or four years cycle through who you get. So you get more teams that you can see twice, um, but less teams you could see overall. You could do any combination of numbers across all that with 15 other teams to play and 20 total conference games. Um, personally, this is my plug. They don't listen to me. And listen to me because I'd sell a lot more of the Jordan stuff or maybe it would just give me a lot more of the Jordan stuff. But I would like the first of those couple options there where you have 10 games uh, that are kind of, you know, five at home, five at road, 10 different opponents. Right. And then you have five games or five teams programs that you're playing on a home and home. Uh, the reason being is I think you could have each team kind of have their five games be like, important nearby uh, rivalry if you want like potting kind of things um so for houston i don't want to play like uh baylor tech kansas and you know oak state kansas state iowa state some two of those three right and i'd want to play those teams home and home for the right i want to make sure i get them at home and then cycle through the other teams, the Arizonas, you know, we'll play one of Arizona, Arizona State out there. We'll play one of BYU and Utah out there. We'll play Colorado out there every other year. We'll go to Cincinnati every other year. We'll go to, um, I don't know, West Virginia every other year. I want to go back and forth like that. They're not asking me. They're not asking me how to do it. But I think that would create, again, you'd see those teams where you're already kind of sharing a fan base or sharing a part of the country. Um, you see them a lot. And you kind of build some rivalry in there that, you know, for Houston, somewhat already exists. But admittedly, you're kind of letting other teams get to build that as well. Some of the newer schools, um, you know, BYU getting to play Colorado and Utah and probably Tech and probably Kansas, right? Like that's like their like tight knit group, um, you know, getting Cincinnati involved with the West Virginias and the Iowa States and the so on, right? Like that would be a good look, I think, for the conference. Um Anyway, that's how I break down the 20 games. It does sound like we're going to 20 games, so that is something to consider that they have to consider. That's why they get paid the big bucks. Um, I think that there's good things and bad things that are 20 games. The good thing is that you're playing less non-conference games. And truthfully, even a stacked non-conference schedule has about 10 or 12 easy non-conference games. It just does. That's the way that 
top tier programs do it. You got to have you know live reps and stuff like that. But for the Big Twelve schedule, you got to get ready for a gauntlet, right? So as a fan, we get less of those non conference games that are giant blowouts, right? That's a good thing. That's a good thing. I promise. Okay. The bad thing is that it looked like Houston, you know, honestly, kind of got run into the dirt last year. Guys kept getting hurt. And what this does is when conference play starts, you now will pretty much have two games a week the entirety of conference play. Last year, there was a stretch where you go from like a big Monday game to the next big Monday game or the inverse, go from a Saturday game with the Saturday game, get like kind of like a, a slot off of the schedule. Adding in two games, as mundane as that sounds, kind of takes away all of your breaks. You're basically playing a Big 12 team, the best conference in all of college basketball. You're playing a team from that conference every three or four days, if not more frequently, right? And it's good for us. We get more basketball to watch. I mean, I can't wait. I mean, talk about like some of the talent across the conference. Uh, North Shadow Mirror just signed with Miami. Uh, Kansas made their transfer portal halls. Houston's running it back and bringing on most use on it. Like a ton of talent in this conference. And so getting to wa- watch more of the conference is going to be exciting and exhilarating. I worry about the long-term way it runs through our guys, but that's a problem for fixing later. It sounds like something's going to happen. And so uh, that's just the reality of it. Now, as we get more bits and pieces of the conference schedule, we'll talk more about it. As we get more information on basketball, we'll talk more about it. Uh, you know, I'd like to talk some this week about NBA draft stuff and Jamal Shedd, but I also know that it's the peak of football offseason. It's going to be an important offseason, heading to an important season. And we got to make sure we talk about that and all things Houston Cougars here each and every day. So make sure to subscribe. Thank you for making your, us your first listen. Locked on Cougs is a proud member of the Locked On Podcast Network, and that means your team every day. Go Cougs.